Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co-hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric. And I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the College Futures Foundation which envisions a California where post-secondary education advances equity and unlocks upward mobility now and for generations to come. To learn more, visit collegefutures.org. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us online at letshearitcast.com. You can find us on LinkedIn and, yes, even on Instagram. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And we're back. Welcome in. Gather around. Just another episode. Of let's hear it. You found Big us. Welcomes and gathers. Let's welcome and gather. Let's let's. You know, Eric, I trust that we're going to have a good time over the next few minutes because there's a lot we should talk about when it comes wow. to trust in civil society. What a coincidence. Because we're going to talk about trust. How you been, by the way, Kirky? Uh, I've been great. How are you? I'm I'm good. You know, all right. I'm going to say something, and you're going to get all crazy. Oh, don't, don't. But, okay. Uh, you're going to get a little nuts. Um, I think the show's going pretty well these days. Ah, oh, that's a happy thing. Yeah. Well, I, I and I can tell you exactly why. I know exactly why. <laughs> Do you want to know why? I have no idea. It's because of this incredible roster of guests you've been assembling. That's exactly oh. why. Oh, These are great why. conversations. And this is where you know I'm going to go crazy because this is exactly <laughs> what should be happening. These discussions should be happening. And you're, you know, this is your service, Mr. Brown. This is your service to the field. <laughs> just it's just like putting, Angie's list. putting the requests out. People come on. They're great discussions. And and I'll say we've gone from the consequential, this is enormous. What we're about to this this might be the most enormous discussion we've ever had on Let's Hear It. The it's most possible. enormous. The most enormous. The most when, when you when you when you break it all down and you get to trust, when you start talking about trust, tell me what's bigger. Tell me it what's bigger. The, it is the enormousest conversation ever. So set it up. Because there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about here. All right. Well, I had a conversation with Kristen Grimm, who folks may remember from the first season Jeez. of Let's Hear It. And so we launched the season in 2019, five years ago and change. But the conversation I had with Kristen, I think, was even before that. Mm. It was, I don't know. Anyway, it was a, a long time ago. But Kristen Grimm, as many folks know, is the founder of Spitfire Strategies. This is like becoming the Spitfire <laughs> channel. <laughs> and, and so we had her back uh, on way back when. And she has since been kicked herself upstairs. She is uh, the whatever. She's the, the <laughs> CEO emeritus. Because as folks know that we've had Jen, we had Jen Karnick, her successor on uh, recently. Uh, but Kristen is, has not gone away. She has not gone gently into that good night to steal from, with apologies to Dylan Thomas. Hmm. And continues to work really, really hard. And she has just now co-authored a new resource called Replenishing Trust, Civil Society's Guide to Reversing the Trust Deficit co-authored with Claire DeLeon, Michael Crawford, and Diana Chun. And I think in a presidential year at a time when societies, communities, you name it, are spinning out of control and trust feels to be so valuable but so hard to come by, I think that this resource is, could not be better timed. Enormously important. And um, mighty thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for supporting the work, though, Kristen's careful to point out they don't necessarily support all the findings. <laughs> they don't agree with it, but they supported it. <laughs> but they helped create it. So let's uh, listen. They probably agree with most of it. I would imagine. I would every imagine. Every single thing. I would imagine. And it was it was shocking to hear you reflect that it had been five years ago that you and Kristen spoke last. I was like, oh, Kristen's back. That's great. All of a sudden, five years went by in a heartbeat. Unbelievable. And a lot of things happened. A lot of things happened in the intervening five years. So they say. So thank you, Kristen, Claire, Michael, Diana, for this work. Replenishing Trust, Civil Society's Guide to Reversing the Trust Deficit, another great contribution from Spitfire Strategies. Much to discuss here. Let's listen to Eric and Kristen and let's hear it and we'll be back. Welcome to Let's Hear It. My guest today is none other than the legendary Kristen Grimm, the founder of Spitfire Strategies. 
Now, Kristen has co-authored a new resource called Replenishing Trust, Civil Society's Guide to Reversing the Trust Deficit. And her co-authors are Claire DeLeon, Michael Crawford, and Diana Chun. And Kristen, you are now a second-time guest. We last spoke, we, you were last on the show, April of 2019. It is true. It's been five years. Uh, how you doing? I, you know, I'm doing good. There was this weird pandemic in the middle of all of that, I as recall. you might recall. No, I do not. I am, but I got to the other side of that, feeling good, but not feeling very good about the rapid decline of trust in society. It has definitely gotten my attention. Wow, that was an extremely good segue. You, you've done this before, but wait, I have other questions before we get into the rapidly declining trust in society. For, so my first question, obviously, is how's retirement? Well, you know, <laughs> it, it's really misnamed. While I did give give Jen Carnig the presidency of Spitfire, and she is doing phenomenal, I should say, the client work continues. And, you know, all the issues I said are so important to work on, unfortunately, are still there. <laughs> and so I find myself you know, counseling a lot of things. It's, so retirement is as busy as being the president of Spitfire. So I haven't I haven't figured out the retirement work less thing. Yeah, I didn't think so. That was a largely rhetorical question. <laughs> and and also, by the way, I should say welcome to Spitfire Radio. We have a, <laughs> That's right. For, That's right. You've had Jan on. Yeah. We had Nima on. So yes. Nima. All sorts of spitfires. Uh, though, uh, we'll we'll try to, even though the equal, whatever, the fairness doctrine in broadcasting is no longer in effect, we will do our best to get lots of other firms and consultants out on because they deserve it too. All right. Yes. So now, as as you very elegantly segued into and I very inelegantly segued us out of, tell me about this new report. Yes. So replenishing trust is for civil society leaders to give them concrete ways to think about how they can build trust in society. As I mentioned, we, we're seeing a real decline in trust. And while it is true that there are chaos agents out there who are contributing to that, it also is that there's not necessarily a lot of people thinking really deliberately about what are the kind of behaviors and practices that institutions can do to build trust. And one of the greatest assets we have in America is our civil society. It's one of the strongest in the world. So actually, as far as rebuilding trust goes, we actually have this great group of leaders that if they would turn their attention to trust, we could actually see a reverse in this decline. And so where did the trust go? Where did the love go, Kristen? Where what? did the love go? Were we, were, we, were we once a very trusting society and now we're not or are we month, months mediocre and now we're horrible well for some people we were once a really trusting society of course there's a number of people in society who never really got a fair shake um, from the institutions and they never had high levels of trust and rationally so for other people we did have higher levels of trust we believe that our institution operated with integrity and, you know, I think it's part of being a democracy, actually, is that people are highly critical of our institutions and for very good reason. And I don't think that the institutions on the other side of it, again, always thought to themselves, you know, we have to actively rebuild trust or in some instances with populations, we have to build trust in the first place. And so there was just sort of this acceptance that people would trust and they don't necessarily. But when you think about how democracy operates, we have to trust strangers, right? We have to trust that strangers and institutions we will never meet will be doing their job. And therefore, my social security check will come and the mail will come and I will die, hopefully, from eating out because the public health will be there. And that when people tell us that climate change is real and we need to get on top of it, they're telling us the truth. So... We really do, as a society, need to have high social trust. So the continued decline, you know, it's okay for it to go up and down sometimes, but it's not okay to be in a steep decline. Well, and you talk about institutions, but institutions are made up of people. And so where are you seeing this as an institutional question and where are you seeing it as a human to human question? You know, I only really am studying it on the institutional level. So I'm really looking at social trust. Like I'm not looking at, you know, Eric, do you trust me? And I trust you. But I am saying, hey, Eric, do you trust Spitfire? And do you trust the entire field of public interest communication? Do we think we have your best interest in society's best interest at heart? And that is really important. So I'm looking at that institutional level. And I think it's easy 
or at least it's convenient to say, gosh, people should be more trusting. And sure, people should be more trusting, but institutions are going to have to go first. So I just remind organizations all the time, to your point, are made up of people and the people make decisions. But especially when you're in the social sector, you're having to make decisions where values clash, frankly. And if you don't explain that very well, if you don't set expectations for that very well, if you don't have the integrity to live up to the values you state are so important, it will decrease trust. You know, so when time's up, who said they believed victims and everybody started to really think about, you know, how we can make sure we don't have sexual assaults in the workplace when they're caught counseling a governor who's been accused, it's a problem. And so we have to look as institutions, we do have to really live up to those values. And again, and when we screw up and we will screw up, we have to say, I'm sorry. You know, this is interesting. I, I was thinking the other day, somebody told, told me that they don't, when they go through a a, an intersection because so many people are running red lights in their town. They don't trust the green light. I mean, yeah. And, and that, Crazy. I think that sense of right. a, a social breakdown, it must have repercussions everywhere. So now when you talk about institutions, obviously the institutions that you and I and many of our listeners care a lot about are foundations and nonprofits, which are one part of our civil society. How, how in your research would you say the foundations and nonprofits are doing kind of in the aggregate as far as trust goes? I mean, they're doing better than some other sectors are, but they're decreasing. It's any, and, and in some instances, they're falling faster than other sectors. So that's the concern. So while it's still above 50%, it's getting closer and closer to that less than half that we really don't want. And again, it's it's understandable to some extent when you either have systemic racism and other systemic issues that have been going on a long time and not solved. That leads to frustration and then real distrust. But also like right now with so many things going on in the world, you know, I think that people really do want to be able to trust people, but then they do things that really backfire. And once people start becoming less trusting too, they're looking for it. So they're looking for the evidence that's going to tell you I really shouldn't trust this nonprofit or this institution. And I think we do behaviors and practices because we're not constantly thinking, is this the most, is this the way to show up in the most trustworthy fashion? So short, small example, but whenever I go to a website now, the very first thing that when I get there, so I'm looking to see like, are there human rights violations going on somewhere or, you know, what's going on with the climate? And instead it's like donate page comes up first. And I know the development people are going to want to kill me, but <laughs> the truth is that immediately doesn't make me think, oh, these people are totally on top of their job. It's like, I already feel like they're just looking at me as like, give them money. It starts to make me think like, are they in financial straits? You know, there's this whole thing that's going on in my head, but what's not necessarily going on in my head is like, this is a super trustworthy organization because that's my first, how I'm building a relationship with them. And now again, it may be that they're going to do other things that are really going to build my trust. And that's the best way for them to be financially stable. But I don't know what those other behaviors are because I'm not seeing those behaviors. So, you know, there's some very specific things that we need to do. And one of them is the trust trio, we call it. And that's really where, you know, people are, they're given a fair shake with your organization. Equality is, is the first one, you know, just like fair shake. The second is competence that you actually are competent to do what you say you're going to do. And the last is that I have hope. And again, I just want you to think about what I just said about I've gone to visit this website and the donation page has come up and it's, it's not doing any of those things. So we're actually doing things that are undermining it ourselves, which we need to stop doing. We need to say, does this action increase trust? And I think if people ask that more regularly, we'd be doing really different things. Now, competence is something that you kind of have to prove. You can't just say it, right? You know, hey, we're, right. Really, we're really competent. How does, how does an organization properly demonstrate competence and then communicate it in a way that doesn't make them look kind of, you know, stupid? Well, I think to your point, though, people do really want to know that you did the thing you said you were going to do. I had this great conversation actually with Patagonia, which at the time last year was ranked one of the top brands in the world, you know, by one of the rankers. And I specifically asked about this issue around 
competence. And one thing that I love that their person said was she said that when they go to do something, so like when there are these supply chain issues, which there are for Patagonia, they don't send out a press release to say they're going to look at the supply chain issue. They said they prefer to send out a press release about what they did about the supply chain issue. And to me, that's a really different way of thinking for organizations. And I know you too, as a communicator, you know, one of the reasons I think I got into this trust building, which, you know, honestly is organizational change. It's not comms all the time, but it's because I'm the one that gets the 11 o'clock phone call, you know, (laughs) at night that says, this looks really bad, right, Kristen? I'm like, this is really bad. (laughs) It's not just that it looks bad. And so I think that's a really important thing too, to say about competence is it is what you did not what you're going to do or not, you know, you're well-intentioned. And I think that can be hard for leaders is that they do feel like people kind of have that attitude, like, what have you done for me lately? But people really want to know that you're walking your talk. Um, And when you're not, and you try and put lipstick on the pig on that front, you know, it's probably, it's a really big problem. People see through it. Um, And right now we have higher levels of skepticism in society. So they're looking for it. You have a lot of scrutiny right now. Well, you, you mentioned a little bit about not thinking that you were going to go and do a trust piece, but what was it about this question that inspired you to spend the time and effort that it takes to put out a report of this level of detail? Yeah, so Alan brooks and I from Robert Wade Johnson Foundation who funded this, and I should say that they don't necessarily agree with all the views, but he and I were really talking about it because we just kept seeing more and more and more report. And as Alan will say, let's quit talking more and more about the problem. Like, I think we're, we now have almost analysis paralysis around it, right? That we, it's just getting worse. And we, we know a lot about it. We hear from a lot of experts about how bad it is, but what we didn't really see was the report that said, what are we supposed to be doing about it? And that was my first hypothesis was we don't know how to build social trust. Like maybe it was one of those things, like it's AI and like, I don't know how to go into chat GPT and get it to do my bidding, but no, actually there's tons of research. So the first thing we did was a big landscape review and found out that, oh, there is a bunch of stuff, but it is kind of buried in all this academic jargon. So, you know, that's the one thing Spitfire likes to do is to say, OK, we're going to translate this. And I really got specific about civil society leaders because, yeah, this might help government and it might help business, too. But I wanted to say, hey, let's use our civil society, which a lot of people do have a lot of folk or is sort of there, you know, to speak truth to power and to have our best intentions front and center. And so that's why we decided to really focus on what civil society leaders could do. Well, there are a lot of delicious tidbits in this report, I have to say. For example, I mean, you, you note that now this is not necessarily about government, but there, you, you gave some examples around government. For example, the National Park Service does really well in the trust meter relative to, say, the Internal Revenue Service, I'm guessing, or immigration. How is that? How does one aspect of a hated institution do so well in the trust meter? (laughs) So I think the first thing to to think about is at least the government is actually asking, which of these, you know, institutions do you trust? And if you don't trust them, why? And so, you know, you hear that the National Park Service has high trust. Now, some of this can seem sort of intuitive. A lot of people have experienced a national park. You go there. It was, in fact, something you could go visit. You were welcomed. Generally, they're clean. The rangers are always nice and tell really, really, really bad dad jokes. <laughs> so I think there's a lot about setting expectations and keeping expectations. Actually, the National Park Service walks their talk in a lot of ways. You know, they're conserving a lot of things there. You see them acting with integrity, which really matters to people, you know, versus immigration and natural services. Like we're regularly seeing them not like if those are our values that they're supposed to be living, I think on a regular basis, you're also seeing them not do that. But again, I I think what's important is in this case, the agency get actual feedback about, well, what is it? that it gives people a pause. And I think it's so important to understand where your trust fractures are as an organization. Like if you don't even know what your trust fractures are, it's going to be really hard to improve them. So I don't think immigration and nat- naturalization services are not going to be a beloved agency like the National Park Service. You know, they don't have Smokey the Bear. They're not going to have Smokey the Bear. I hope somebody doesn't propose that. But I also think that they can do things where people feel like they're treating people really fairly. I think they can be doing things where they seem like they're actually helping with the problem when people are really concerned about immigration rather than making it worse. So I think they've been given really good guidance. Now, again, do I think that that agency really is trying to build 
high social trust? I, I'm not sure. I, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard that. <laughs> so it would be good if they did it more deliberately. Well, we're going to take a very quick break and be back with Kristen Grimm to talk about this new report. We trust that you will come back and we'll see you in a second. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. If you're enjoying this episode, you may just be a rule breaker. Tune in to Break Fake Rules, a new limited series podcast with Glenn Galich, CEO of the Stupsky Foundation. Hear from leaders in philanthropy, nonprofits, government, media, and more to learn about challenges they've overcome by breaking fake rules and which rules we should commit to breaking together. We are also sponsored by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Check out their amazingly good podcast. And we're not just saying that. Stop and talk. Hosted by Prebis Foundation CEO Grant Oliphant. You can find them at stopandtalkpodcast.com. And now, back to the show. And I'm back with Kristen Grimm, the founder of Spitfire Strategies and the co-author of a new resource called Replenishing Trust, Civil Society's Guide to Reversing the Trust Deficit. You had mentioned a little bit about how the National Park Service asks their visitors a lot of questions. How tuned in do you think most organizations are about how well they are trusted? I mean, do they think they're more trustworthy than they actually are? I mean, how, do, how are they getting feedback and what are they doing about it? I do think that organizations are starting to really hone in on this sense of trust. I think in other ways, they it might have been like when you think about the Center for Effective Philanthropy, who, of course, does grantee perception reports, you know, they may not be asking specifically, like, do you trust us? But really, when you add up a bunch of that grantee perception, you can kind of know if they trust that foundation or not. Although I think it would be easier if you just asked it straight up. And, and certainly, I think organizations, you know, as they're doing more to check in on their own teams and how do people feel about the direction of the organization? How do they feel about leadership? I think a lot of these are proxies for um, do you trust us? I don't know, though, that people really say I have these trust fractures that we really need to put together. Like, for example, you know, if you happen to say you want to be a really diverse organization and then your organizational stats come out and you're not a very diverse organization, you know, either you could be silent and not really say, just be like, we're reporting on it. So what? You could try and rationalize that. And I think in some cases, when people do that and they step in it, like we're having a really hard time finding qualified candidates. I think that now you're starting to actually step in it on the trust front versus we see that we've really fallen short from where we expected to be. Here are some concrete actions we're planning to take and hold ourselves accountable for it, including asking for participation of the staff. What do you, how do you think we should solve this problem? Because people really expect to be participating with organizations as you both set and live your moral norms. Well, you do a really good job in the report talking about what you do when the trust gets broken. And it's, I would say it's, like a classic, wonderful guide for crisis communications. What yes. can, can you talk more about what the what the report is, what's in it, and how folks can use it? The report goes through several sections, which I think are the right building blocks for getting on top of how can you be building strong trust. And the first is to actually decide what is the spirit of trust you want to have and with whom. I think it's so important for you to understand. I want to be trusted on the following things. You can't be trusted on everything, as I mentioned. Your values are you're going to clash. If you're the ACLU, people better know free speech is your number one value because sometimes you're going to do that instead of some other values, which might also be very important. So the spirit of trusting and with who you want to have it, really important. And I would say that that's a collaborative document, right? Like what is your spirit of trust should be with your board and your staff and the communities closest to you? Then you need to assess, well, where are we? So you might see as a sector, it's declining, Maybe you're one of the highest, best trusted organizations in the world. Maybe you're one of the worst, but you better know what it is. So we have 11 signs of high trust. So you're looking, how many of these signs can you find? And then we go through like, okay, so what are trust fractures and how might they show up? So an example is a social trap. Social trap is basically says, I know that I should do this and it's really good for everybody if I were to do this, but I don't think someone else is going to do it, so I'm not going to do it. So if you look at water restrictions, I live in the West. We all know we're not supposed to be watering our lawns every day, but I see my neighbor. 
So the next thing I know, I'm doing it. So we all know we're not supposed to be doing it, but we're in this social trap because we actually don't trust each other. To your point of of the, the light earlier, if we don't trust that everybody's going to stop at the light, then it becomes a real free-for-all. And then we say, okay, so now you know what your level of trust is. Here are 10 concrete behaviors and practices you can do that might help you contribute to higher social trust. And we go through walk your talk. We talk about putting your best foot forward and we talk about don't step in it. So there are these 10, and I don't expect anybody who's going to be able to be like, I got all 10 right now. Like, yeah, it's going to take a little while. But I also think if you really understand what you're dealing with, you might say, you know what? We got to be a little better on the integrity front. I know that sounds crazy, but there are so many organizations who make these big statements and you and I know them because we help craft them. And then boy, do their actions not back them up. So just aligning, you know, I'd start there. I'd really align and say, where could we just align better and immediately be better off and be building more trust? Well, we've both worked with a lot of foundations over the years. And it it occurs to me that trust in the context of power differentials is especially important and challenging and dangerous and all those things. And foundations are always talking about trying to build trusting relationships with their grantees because they have the power and the grantees will tell them what they need to hear or they feel like they have to do that. Is is there anything in particular about that relationship that you think foundations can do better and how would they do that? You definitely can signal to your communities that you trust them in order to get mutual trust going. So I, you and I both know this, there's a lot of foundation practices that really suggest we don't trust you. Whether it's, you know, the amount of details you have to give, the idea that you might put in evaluation reports that many people know their program officers do not look at. So at that point, you know, you're really feeling like somebody's just checking a box and checking up on you because they don't trust you. It's not that we're actually going to really look at this evaluation and have a deep conversation about it. Again, not for everybody, but for some. Um, So I think it's so important. I think a lot of the times I was actually talking to Mayor Carter out of St. Paul, and he just talks about how like constantly surrounding you in a community is how the government doesn't trust you. You know, whether it's having to fill out all these forms, you have to prove, you know, you need waivers so that your kids can play in after school. Like you can't just come in and say, I can't afford this, but I'd like my kid to play. And you're just taking your words taken for it. It's the exact opposite, right? And I think we do that a lot in our institutions as well, is we constantly signal to people like, I don't really trust you, so I'm going to make you jump through these hoops. I have a feeling that the pandemic had a lot of bad effects on us, not the least of which is that it feels to me that remote work is eroding trust as well. What have you seen there? For trust to happen, you really have to trust what's called access points. So I think when you're working so remote, you don't get to interact with people. Our brains tend to think of things negatively versus positively, like we're kind of biased in that direction. So I think that when you're on a Zoom call and someone's 10 minutes late, pretty soon you're making up this whole story about that person and they disregard your time and they're always late and they don't really respect you. And of course, then I think trust starts to go down. So I I think that, you know, in a pandemic world where we in some ways are more connected than we've ever been, but really not in deep relational ways. And we're not necessarily behaving in ways that improve trust. We're in fact doing things that counter trust. And similarly, Folks who who worked in offices and were face to face and had the lovely opportunity to have dinner together, for example, or drinks or just spend quality time as people, not little boxes on a screen, feels to me like they they have built trust because they've spent time together. And folks who came into the workforce during the pandemic haven't. And I think there's a generational component there, too. Are we also seeing trust? even greater generation gaps than, we, you know, generation gaps has always been an issue. But it, it again, I feel like in many of these organizations, I see that young people and people of a different generation are having a really hard time building the kinds of bonds you need to be effective to say the things that you need to say to manage. How about that one? What If I'm a manager, how do I deal with my the folks that I'm working with who may not necessarily have had those experiences? It it definitely, when you talk about it, is you have to want to be in relationship with people. 
And so you do have to do those deep things that if you can't do them in person, which of course is harder, but you do have to find ways that you can really be in conversation with people. And I would say too, I was talking about these moral norms, you know, people when they're in organizations, they fully expect that they get to contribute and they get to participate in setting of moral norms. And I think right now we're definitely seeing that within a generation. We may say our moral norms of how we operate are this, and they're like, you know, we should really talk about that. Like we have it at Spitfire a lot where we're talking about how are we going to use AI ethically in our work? And everybody on staff believes that they get to have an input on that. And indeed they do. And I think that's actually one of the best things about the internet when you consider it is that you are able, it used to be like you couldn't have a staff meeting if people weren't physically there. And now you could have a town hall globally, you know, if you pick the right time zone. But it also means that people fully expect that you will both ask them to participate. And even if you don't do exactly what they say, like they actually want to hear back. Like, so what did you do with that? Again, I think there's a lot more accountability um, that needs to happen, which is, again, part of that relationship building, which is to say we're accountable to each other because we have highly participatory tools now. Is there anything that you learned from doing this report that really surprised you? I guess two things probably really surprised me. One is that I always knew it about that you shouldn't other other people. I mean, I knew it. I know it's probably not right. But I mean, as a campaigner, it also is how you win campaigns. And so it definitely says you need to do deep in-group bonding without othering. And when you think about it, that's not so easy. Like, what exactly are you coalescing around? Like, the Proud Boys have very high trust right? But that's because they other the heck out of all sorts of other people. So suddenly if you say to to people, you know what, you need to do deep in-group bonding because it's super important and you have to do it in a way that doesn't other, your mind starts to think about like, well, how would you do that? (laughs) So I think it's just we're, we're really into vilifying people as opposed to things. So if you look at the Brooklyn Public Library has actually been doing a really great campaign on Unbanned. And so they'll give a library card to any kid who wants it right now so that they can have access to digital resources. But what's important is they're really about bonding over a love of books and having access to what you want to read. And they're not going after like the moms who are trying to get books taken away because that's the othering part. And the truth is, as a society, if we want higher trust, we can't be dehumanizing some people while we're kind of complaining that they're dehumanizing us. Again, we're in a social trap, right? Is when, we, when we're when we all dehumanizing, it's just not great. So that was a big thing. The other is just to try and figure out how do you build trust in a pluralistic society? Like a lot of the literature actually said the best thing would be for everybody to assimilate. And I was like, oh, well, we will not be writing that in the sky. So <laughs> obviously like, What the social scientists are sort of like, yeah, you wanted it fastest, easiest, right? But that's totally not possible in the United States. It is really interesting, though, is to think about. So if we're really, really, really so different, then how are we ever going to come up with these moral norms that we're willing to live with in a pluralistic society? Because, again, if we don't trust each other enough to make these civic bargains, then they don't hold. And not only are we all running through red lights, as you've mentioned but we're actually not agreeing who won elections and we're not abiding by some people's laws because of who made them. And that's not a good path to be on. Well, yeah, what an important way of taking all that work and bringing it together. Apart from reading this report, for, for, for an organization that is thinking about this, they hear about your work, they think to themselves, okay, we probably need to examine this question. What would you say the one most important thing an organization can do to begin to understand how to build trust? I would really embrace the idea that every action you take is either building it or breaking it. And so I would start to look at everything through that lens, because it might be that I have to make this really hard decision. You're still going to make hard decisions. And if I make it this way and explain it this way, it's actually going to build trust because I'm going to involve the right people and I'm going to handle it the way I need to handle it versus just doing it, maybe hoping nobody saw it, hoping everybody totally understood why you did it. So again, I think when you're really going about your day, you can ask yourself, again, I hope everybody goes and looks at their website and says, is this building trust? And is it worth it? Is it worth it for the money we're making if it's not? And again, who knows what that answer is, but I would love that 
that organizations are just asking the question. I think they'll make different decisions that will replenish trust in our society. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. And as ever, Kristen, another excellent, fabulous product out of Spitfire Strategies. And frankly, I'm happy that you did it because it gave me the excuse to have this conversation with you and to see you. Thank you so much for coming. Spitfire Strategies is a, a great friend and a terrific place. And, and you've been such a great leader and continue to be. And uh, just I encourage people to to check out Replenishing Trust, Civil Society's Guide to Reversing the Trust Deficit, co-written with Claire DeLeon, Michael Crawford, and Diana Chun. Kristen, thank you as ever for just being you. Thank you, Eric. I'll see you in five years. <laughs> Thanks again. And we're back. So, Mr. Brown, Mr. Mr. Brown, Brown, I think that we're witnessing the birth of a whole new field with this conversation. Uh-huh. You are not going to address trust in America. And and once again, Kristen's done it. Once again, Kristen's done it. Put her finger right on the pulse of something that's crucially important to address. But you are not going to reverse this just with a single publication and Spitfire doing some training on it. And, and, I, and I offered to you the climate crisis. How many people are working on climate change and, 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 and how enormous that is? Now, if you want to build trust in every dimension of America, including civil society, imagine what's going to have to go into that. So, so let's just start there. Once again, Kristen Grin's done it, putting her finger on the pulse of what's absolutely needed in creating a training resource. And, 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 and I will say that the uh, smart chart might have employed a number of Spitfire people over the years, but it employed about 1 million other communications consultants who grabbed that resource and brought it into the field. So what do you think? This trust thing, it's right. I mean, there's a lot to talk about here, but but I think we're witnessing the birth of a whole new a whole new field of support that's needed. I, yeah, I didn't realize you were going there, but I think you may be right, Kirk. As usual, you have a tendency to find the, the kernel of it, the thing of it. Uh, yes, I think there are two things that are going on, two takeaways that I have. From, from this conversation and this, this concept of trust, one of which is that you can do great things, but if the folks that you are attempting to engage, if you haven't built trust with them already, then you, you can't just kind of walk through the door and say, here's your stuff. Now you should trust me. And I think that goes for funders. I think it's going right now for government funding. For example, government funding under the Inflation Reduction Act to put together infrastructure around green technology is meeting resistance in some communities because people are like, ah, you, I don't know you. You, you say you're going to have all these jobs, but I don't really trust it yet. Building that trust takes time and it's going to be a challenge, but you can start to put legislation in place. You have to have the relationships as well in order to be able to ensure that those things can take hold. So, I mean, I think for folks who are looking into this election right now or who are hoping to come in and start new things, you have to understand that there may well be trust deficits that you are operating against and you have to do whatever you can, however you can to begin to build that trust. So that's one thing. Oh, and, the, and then the other thing, and then and then go for it, which is that trust is very, very hard to earn and really easy to screw up and very, very difficult to regain. And so that's as you run your organization, as you think about how you're engaging with whomever you engage with, that that lesson feels to me to be essential. Well, and you have to be deep in communications, well steeped, well versed in what's happening in the field to understand this dynamic of around trust, I think, as well as Kristen and her team are are speaking to it because so let's step back for a second and let's just talk about what are we talking about here. So first of all, trust is measurable and it has been measured. And a bunch of people have been measuring it over time, and it's been persistently degrading public trust and public institutions, and it's even by messenger. So, you, And Kristen sp- speaks to this during the interview. You can evaluate trust across a bunch of different metrics, the, the person, the messenger, the institution, what have you. And across the board, trust is is going down in America. We don't trust each other as much anymore, and it's been going down for decades. This isn't a recent phenomenon and so, so really, I, 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 I'm so appreciative of Kristen and her team and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to be like, yeah, actually, we'll be partners in you because this is, this is again, this kind of like, let's get to the edge of the envelope. Let's, let's, let's push things. Let's get over the horizon a little bit. 
I really applaud them for doing this work because this is, I was trying to think what is the right metaphor to describe what's happening with trust in America. And it's almost like you see this disease of distrust laying claim. And, and, and I mean, you must have certainly, you've seen this across your field, but even in the, in the, in the philanthropic sector and, 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 and trust, lack of trust makes everything more difficult is, is what I would say. Well, I, I, can totally relate because I trusted you to do this stupid podcast and see where it got me. So, you know, now you're, yeah, you have to rebuild that trust with me, Kirk. That's right. I'm starting to look at the, at the tips that Chris and Steve has. So let me see. I've got, I need to walk my what talk. What are you going to do? I'm going to put gonna... my best foot forward. I'm going to try not to step in it. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. It's it's interesting. I was reading an article today about trust-based philanthropy. Mackenzie Scott mm. just released another very, very large set of grants. And people said, oh, yeah, look, this is trust-based philanthropy. She's giving large, long-term general support grants with very, very little paperwork involved. And then there's been a pushback in that this isn't tradition. This isn't trust-based philanthropy as you would think it is, because that involves deep relationships mm-hmm. and long-term engagement and other things. And this is not that. This is not to say that what, what what she's doing isn't great, but let's not conflate that too much with so-called trust-based philanthropy, which involves a long time of spending time together, engaging with each other, learning what's working and what's not, saying things that are risky and not being penalized for it, all of that kind of stuff. And therefore we we have to begin to do this now they're like there's no time like the present to begin to or to deepen the trust that you have with whomever you're working with i think the most important thing especially in philanthropy getting getting candor from people whether it's grantees talking to their funders or funders frankly talking to their grantees is so hard because of the power dynamic it's not equal but once you get to that, once you have relationships with folks in which they say, this thing that you gave us money for isn't working, and so therefore we would like to pre-program that money or we would like to talk with you about how to fix it or whatever, once you get to that point, that's when you really start making a difference, when you can be candid about what's not working. And like I said, it works both ways because the funder could say, hey, look, we funded you to do this thing and it was a bad idea. We realize that the strategy is incorrect. We understand that your organization has had to change in order to meet our fabulous strategy that doesn't work. And so therefore, we're going to make that right. Well, that builds trust, too. So those sorts of things are hard to do. They take time. But you have to do them because otherwise we're just kind of playing patty cake, if you ask me. I I don't want to be too harsh, but I don't think you're going to nearly get where you need to go unless you can have those kinds of conversations. Well, and I think for a field that's rooted in social and progressive change, this is the asymmetrical fight that we're kind of in. You know, the classic fear, uncertainty, and doubt strategy to slow anything down is to erode trust, erode trust. Right. And, and so this, you know, Chris only mentioned it briefly, the chaos agents and some of the other writing the team has done, you know, they, they, they describe these bad actors who are deliberately trying to undermine trust. And and I think this is something that as a field, we really have to think about, you know, this this notion that w- whenever we're trying to do to create positive change, it, it requires a certain trust that the agents, the institutions, the entities that we're going to lean into to support and, and create that change are going to deliver on whatever that promises. And so the sea, this enormous sea, this this engine of mistrust and disinformation and misinformation. This is why Conspiracy Kirk has had such a, a time at times <laughs> on this podcast, because it's such I think it's so it runs to the heart of our strategies that there's an organized effort to undermine trust and trust in, in society and in, in, in trustful relationships. So so this is a piece of it, though, and I love that um, Chris and, and her team have focused on civil society because civil society has an outsized role maybe to play in trying to reverse some of these trends. But I was thinking and hearing your conversation and in, in reading what's been written about this report, is this another version of almost like deficit storytelling? of trying to like reverse deficit storytelling, you know, because for all of us, what's the easiest, what's the best, you know, again, it's back to the, if it bleeds, it leads kind of thing. Well, what's the easiest move to make point to government, point to civil institutions and say, look how they're selling you out. Look how they're selling you short. And in fact, for the things we care about, when you're talking about systemic issues around equity, around race, around equality, 
guess what? That's exactly what's happened. You know, we've talked about it on this podcast. It's, you know, the red lines were drawn. There were right. these, they were lost, but in the place. So to me, this is the, this is the really difficult thing that's at the heart of this is how do we put a spotlight on change in a positive way, but we're not necessarily just going to keep, because there's nobody who gets up in the morning and says, Hey, let me pitch and tell stories that just talk about how profoundly positive it is that we've got a thing called civil society and government on our sides. Like nobody's pitching that work, but a lot of people pitch the other side of it, which is like, Hey, let's, let's look and see where these things are falling down. So this is why I think Eric, this is such an enormous conversation in enterprise. Don't you think, I mean, who's actually doing this work of actually tr- trying to get out of this deficit storytelling and say, no, actually we need to tell some positive stories about what's really happening. Cause in fact, in, in many cases, that's really the more true story to tell about what's happening. Well, the answer to your question is Travian and Shorters. Yeah. And I, yeah. I do believe that our field has been so influenced by this understanding about asset framing is that we, you have to build hope and you have to paint this picture of an inevitable better world so that people can begin to take that in. You're right. It is so much easier to be on the no side of a ballot measure, for example. <laughs> it is so much easier to encourage nothing happening, to reject the future, to reject hope, to reject anything that is new and unknown. It is, you know, it's easy to look back and to, yeah, to sow discontent. That that makes our jobs a lot harder, but I would argue that it makes the victories that much deeper. Hmm. That if you can help encourage your constituents, your audiences, your partners, your whomever to engage in something new and better. And you begin to see the value and the victories and the other stuff. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a very, very strong bond. It is far stronger than the kind of the negative energy and the rejectionism that we see in much of politics. Those things are highly transactional. And I don't think that they're deep. I think they're based on fear and anger or frustration or whatever. But those victories where you're working together and you're building towards something and you achieve it, those victories are are bonds that you can build on. You can build amazing things to move forward on. And that's where we see things like marriage equality and other other social issues where you're seeing like a kind of a generational change in a very short period of time or relatively short period of time. Or maybe that that's not even it. The, the kind of the arc of it was a long time, but the tipping point happened quickly. And once that happens, then all of a sudden you have great bonds that you're building on. One more thing that I would say is that, and, and this is something that Kristen uh, alludes to in our conversation, is that many organizations probably think that they have more trust with their partners and <laughs> constituents and whoever's than they actually have. Yeah, right. And whatever organization you're at or whatever work that you're doing, I think testing that proposition is really important. You should never assume that you have trust that you can't prove that you have. And finding the way to have the kinds of conversations in which you can reveal things that you need to reveal so that you can learn to be honest and more connected, I think is really important. You should always do it, no matter what. And that's something I think every organization can do is this, you know, kind of trust, whatever you want to call it, checklist or whatever it's referred to. Well, and this is Christian's genius, right? Because she's able to take these really difficult topics, these enormously complicated topics and break them down at these crucial elements. And I love that discussion at the end when the, when you were like, hey, what's the most important thing you can do? And Kristen was like, you know, actually, it's kind of binary. Everything you're doing is either building or breaking trust. So start there. Think about whether or not you're building or breaking trust. And then you know, I loved I loved the trust trio that she wrenched. Give people a fair shake. Make sure you're competent. And you hope, you know, and then this publication is full of steps, tangible, specific steps that leaders can take to help foster an environment of trust. And so I love always that part of SARS work. And this is why they create whole fields. You know, Kristen doesn't just write the report and then, then she does her trainings. No, she sparks a whole field because by making it so clear she builds capacity, which has been her goal from the get go. And so she's not just going to build capacity in these organizations and actually learn these lessons and, and, and work and behave this way in a, in a more thoughtful way. But she's going to foster a whole cadre of trainers to come in and help support all this too. I think that's what's going to happen with this, Eric. Well, you know, Kristen just has so much, I don't know what you want to call it, currency, <laughs> legitimacy in yeah. our field. She yeah. really is kind of the godhead for a lot of folks like me. And it may sound trite, but if she says it, 
it's a good thing. It's a good thing. I could totally trust her because she's been around so long. She's so smart and so creative and she really, really understands how you make change. And this is a, a really good resource. It's it's such important work. And as you say, she's hit on this really important topic that I think we kind of give short shrift to and and we can't if we really if we want to succeed. And it's been measured. Trust is going down in America. Imagine what happens if we start living in an America where trust is being restored and replenished. And Kristen spoke to it. It's going to restore faith in our democracy. It's going to help. It's going to help clear the way for additional avenues for social change, whatever that's going to be. It's going to make people feel more as opposed to less included. The consequences of rebuilding trust are enormous. And it, this is where I go back to. This might be the most significant topic we've ever addressed on this podcast because every category of conversation that we've had will fit underneath this rubric of trust. Everything we're trying to do, if you there's more trust, it's going to be easier to get those things done. That's what I think, at least. Well, I think you're right. I mean, if you just look at it, people don't trust that the economy that's improving is improving. Yes, exactly right. Like, they don't trust their own lying eyes. Yeah. And I think that really speaks to a potential for a true breakdown. And arresting that is essential. If, as you say, if we're going to be able to move forward and, and build a better future, we have to let people begin to hope again and begin to feel like the things that the green sprouts that they're seeing are actually going to become forests. So what's your prognosis? What what would you say if civil society adopts the steps that Kristen's putting forward and the recommendations, embraces wholeheartedly the recommendations for how to build trust, facilitate trust, you know, make course corrections if, if trust isn't there. If civil society as a whole started embracing this notion of it, you're either building trust or you're breaking trust and civil society said, we are going to explicitly try to build trust. What impact do you think that could have? Like, like, what change do you think we can make if this work is done and done effectively? Well, for, for one thing, I feel like it's a prerequisite. It's not the end goal. It is the beginning thing. Mm -hmm. It's what you build everything on. It allows you for a lot more opportunity for creativity. It allows you to try and fail things. It just gives you so many more opportunities to succeed. And also when things go bad and things always go bad, nothing ever goes the way you think it's going to. You have to be able to fall back on these, these trust relationships in order to learn from and move forward because either you're building or you're breaking. Yeah. And, and I think that, so that's a starting point. I don't think it's an end goal. It's absolutely a starting point. Without it, we end up with these very refracted and disconnected and disjointed and highly transactional Everything, whether they're campaigns, initiatives, strategies, you name it. Uh, it's really, really hard to build for the long term if you don't have trust. Well, and, you know, so kind of after version 2.0 of this, because there's going to be a series of things here that are going to be required. But I would love to see, to your point about the economy is improving, but people aren't able to say it, even though they're experiencing it. I'd love to see, and, and Kristen pointed out that there's been a ton of research in this field. And so the first thing they, that her, she and her team did is actually creating a landscape assessment of all that's been done so that she could use that to guide their work and their thinking on this topic. But this process, a better understanding of what's happening in the information landscape that's actually affecting this whole conversation around trust and what, what are we hearing, what are we thinking, and why, what's sticking and what's not and why. And this is something we've talked about. And maybe we can have some folks on the podcast to address this piece. But this part that I, I think we're really struggling with as a field right now, how do we know what's out there? What's, what's connecting? How is it connecting? Where is it coming from? What's the information people are seeing? I feel like we're in kind of a rudderless period almost right now in terms of like, how do we understand communication is actually working? What is the information that's flowing through? Because these disconnects, these disconnects between the clear evidence on one hand and then what people will report and say they're actually seeing in their lives, what accounts for that disconnect? And I don't know that we quite understand that, or at least I don't. And so I'd love to talk to, be, to people that actually, that really get that. One last thing I'd love to talk about before we go, because this is a subtext in this conversation with Kristen, is that Kristen is affecting a transition at Spitfire where she's basically fake retired. So she's <laughs> handed over leadership to a very competent leader who's been on the podcast. And right. now Kristen is is doing that thing where she's focused on work that continues to draw her while she's facilitating leadership change. 
the significance of that decision, the significance of the work that went into making that possible for Spitfire and modeling what it looks like to create a transition so that there's new leaders that are going to come to four. You worked for a foundation that did this systematically and programmatically. People work for right. seven years and then they leave. Eight. And eight. Okay, whatever the number is. And and I, it, it's a very tricky thing, right? Because, you know, is it should it be seven? Should it be eight? Should it be 10? Should it happen at all? Who knows? But we know that as a field, we need this steady turning over of talent in terms of leadership and, and all those kinds of things. And so for Kristen to be able to actually basically recreate her position still in the context of an organization that she created and that she loves while she's creating opportunities for others to come forward and lead. And it's even in this document, you know, it's not just Kristen's work. You know, Kristen is working here alongside her co-authors, Claire and Michael and Diana, creating opportunities for other leaders to come forward and have their time in the sun. It's again, Kristen is modeling something, talking about trust this is how you build trust. You, you don't say what you're going to do. You show what you're going to do with your actions. I just I just think it's a really significant thing that Kristen is doing and it needs to be applauded. Yeah, I, I totally agree. We we need to be building. I mean, it's not just building a bench, but it's it's sharing space with folks who can contribute. And like, you know, what the hell do we know? <laughs> so let me bring everybody else knows. Let me bring you back to the first question. Is this trust? The single most difficult issue we've ever discussed in this podcast. Oh, huh. I don't know. Maybe. No, it's, yeah, I mean, it's easy in that you say, yes, we need it. It's not one of those things like, huh, what should we do? <laughs> oh, we should build trust. <laughs> it may be the single hardest thing to actually do to succeed at. Mm. So, yeah, no and yes is the answer to your excellent question. There you go. Well, what a terrific contribution. And Kristen and your team at Sitfire, thank you again for putting this work out there. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, thank you for supporting it. So we're replenishing trust, Civil Society's Guide to Reversing the Trust Deficit. Kristen Grimm, Claire de Leon, Michael Crawford, and Diana Chun of Spitfire. Thank you for birthing a whole field, a whole new movement. We look forward to seeing where it goes. And Eric, once again, you've done it. And that's why our podcast is doing well, because you're bringing Yay. great people here, having great conversations, and they should be heard. And I'm glad people are listening to it. Well, I'm glad people are tuning into the Spitfire channel. <laughs> there you go. So we'll be back next time on the Spitfire channel. Someone else from Spitfire. That's great. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. And let's hear it. Okay, everybody. That's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on this show. And that definitely includes yourself. And we'd like to thank our indefatigable producer, Harper Brown, John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music, our sponsor, the Lumina Foundation. And please check out Lumina's terrific podcast, Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent. And you can find that at LuminaFoundation.org. We certainly thank today's guest and, of course, all of you. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Brown. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Brown. Okay, everybody. Until next time.